devotees, and welcome back to the lucky number 7 edition of Sucker Shots. I am Jason Burgos, and on tonight's episode of this MMASucker.com exclusive podcast, we will be covering this Saturday's UFC 210, which is headlined by a light heavyweight title memory match between Daniel Cormier and Anthony Johnson. As is the story with this show, I will have a guest on to chat about their career and then help me analyze and make picks for the event. On this episode, I have as my guest one of the top amateur MMA prospects in the entire Northeast. He has held bantamweight titles for New York Fight Exchange, KTFO, and Aggressive Combat Championship. He is Luis the Assassin Gonzalez. Lewis, how you doing, man? How are you doing, Jason? Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. I'm glad to have you on because for a while now, I've been really hoping to get to a top level, talk to a top level amateur prospect just to get the process you guys go through because it's, a, you know, amateur fighters, be it boxing or MRA, is like, you know, amateur athletes and other sports like college basketball or, or NFL, like you guys are truly doing it for the passion of the sport. And I want to get your take on it so i want to jump right into the questions i have for you the first one is now like the fight game in general is very difficult it's a very difficult undertaking to take to get into like what were your early influences and reasons that made you want to take this journey towards becoming an eventual professional mma fighter i want to say early on um kung fu movies uh stuff like that but i love boxing boxing was my first love um watching you know tyson uh, i would sit there and watch old fights and just rewatch anything i can get my hands on um so that was my biggest influence i just loved the idea of boxing and then a little corny but you see the power rangers and all the kung fu and all that stuff and then watching like dragon ball z and seeing all that cool moves and you're like yep. man i wish i could do that <laughs> uh, like street fighter was also a big influence um just playing those type of games and it was just around and it, it slowly you just build that up and then there was a lot a lot of other influences as I got older but early on it was really you know uh boxing was my love and cartoons <laughs> At what age did you like make the decision? Like, okay, I, I wanna, I, I'm gonna do this. Like, I'm sure you always, you know, you had the interest, but what, at what age did you say, okay, this is something I really want to get into and put the, the, the effort and and time that need to take to do this. It was a little later on, like after I was in college already, and uh, I want to say my sophomore year in college i'm sitting around i stopped playing baseball and football and other stuff living that college life working and studying and um some family i want to say family crisis uh happened i had a one of my cousins she came back from iraq uh, and she was always like hey you know let's all work out let's work out let's try let's try kickboxing and i'm like Okay, yeah, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> never really got in, never really had the time or I never made the time to do it. But uh, I had a couple of cousins that were black belts in karate. And one day I'm like, you know what? Let me, let me pass by. And I took a week's worth of class. Paid for a year. It took a week's worth of classes. Uh, living that New York lifestyle. Yep. Then um, my cousin fell sick. Uh, and while... She was in the hospital. Um, I was like, hey, Day, you know, when when you get better, uh, we're going to take that kickboxing class. We're, we're going to go. And uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away of cancer. And I, I never, I was never able to take that class. So one day I'm passing by um, near my home, walking home. And I see a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school. I was like, oh, East Coast United, what's this? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, they do kickboxing as well. All right, so I walk in. Lo and behold, I see a picture of a gentleman named Mike Casey. And I'm like, I know this guy. He actually was teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in um, the karate school. I took the week's worth of classes. Oh, like, wow. Like, oh, you know what? Hey, that you know that was awesome. What they were doing was awesome. I went to experience it, and I, I met Coach Tito. And first thing it was like, hey, I just want to lose weight. I want to get in shape. I want to try this kickboxing thing. And we were a small school and started off just training, training. I'm already at the time like 21, going on 22. Mm -hmm. And that led to 
three classes a week led to, hey, let me do five classes a week. Kickboxing led to jujitsu. <laughs> so eventually coach is like, hey, do you want to do a jujitsu tournament? I'm like, sure. Then that became, do you want to do a, a Muay Thai striking match? All right, cool. And then it just, the love started growing rapidly from there. I just, I went from, I just wanted to test myself and maybe lose a little weight to full blown out. Like this, this is what I'm going to do. Like I, I spent most of my life dreaming about it, but now it's time. And when you get to that point where, you know, you're progressing from like art to art and, you know, you get to MMA, how does like, how does one go about the process of becoming and starting to do amateur bouts? Like, did you decide like, okay, could you, you know, set me up? I want to be in a bout. Did your coaches at East Coast, you know, decide, okay, you know, like, how do you go about it? Like, do they do the work of contacting organizations? Do you have to do it? Is it all you together? Like, how does that, how does it about for an amateur fighter come together? Well, for at East Coast, um... Coach Tito handles that in terms of he'll ask us if we want to fight. It's never been I've never been pressured into fighting. I'll let him know like, hey, I'm I'm interested in competing, and he'll say, okay, um, do you want to do? First, we always started out with at least when I started with uh, Thai boxing. Do you want to do a Thai boxing fight? All right, cool. We'll get you a Thai boxing fight. Depending on how we did there, then it will progress to his. His philosophy is he'll if we cannot defend ourselves with jujitsu and defend ourselves on the feet, then we're not even able to really go up there and spar. So we have to prove to him at least in the classes that we can hang, you know, actually take a punch and not cringe. And then <laughs> he, if we're interested, he'll yeah. he'll find this a fight. All right. Uh, now, I mean, not many people understand. Like, I was making the comparison with college, you know, f- sports. How difficult the life is for an amateur fighter. You know, at least in college sports, you're on a scholarship. You got you're in a dorm room. You're taken care of. I mean, we all know about the side payments and everything that happens yeah. in college athletics. Now, you know, how do you go about? Since there isn't financial gain yet as an amateur, you're not allowed to get paid. How do you, you know, make ends meet and finance this passion of yours to eventually go pro? Like, do you have a day job and like, what do you do yeah. to pay for it all? I have a day job. Um, you know, I, I work full time. I also uh, teach some classes for Coach Tito whenever he's not able to teach, and you know private classes, things of that nature. So sometimes it becomes a long day. Because you got to make sure the bills are paid, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not exact. At being an amateur, you're not making any type of money for yeah. what you're doing. So you got to figure out how to pay the bills. So as an amateur, are you are even allowed to, like, have sponsorships? Like, can you put, like, uh, brands or, you know, places, advertisers on your shorts? Are you not even allowed to do that? No, we, we're we allowed to do that. That's okay. on our own. We have to go out there and get it. We yeah. just, like... We have to maintain that amateurism, and we technically don't get paid. There's nothing like there's no financial gain for fighting. And what's that? What has you have you gone through the process of trying to get advertisements to make extra money? And is it difficult at all? Well, it can be difficult coming from a small school. Uh, I've noticed a lot of the guys at the amateur level that are getting sponsored. It's they they come from the bigger camps, so they already have a relationship with some of these sponsors. Right. So it makes it a little easier. Also, depending on who's around you and finding sponsorships as an amateur is a little difficult because you have they don't know you. And depending on the area you're in, I've been lucky to reach out to a couple of sponsors. Like for example, the fence. So I reached out to them then. Right away, a guy text, uh, sent me an email back, like, and we built a great rapport since then. So they've been my main sponsor so far. You know, and they, they've been great. I, everybody go check them out, defensehope.com. Um, but sponsorships are a little tough to get. Now, you've had a very successful go at it as amateur. You're six and one, correct? Yes, sir. You're six and one. You've had you know titles in three different companies, very legit companies. Um, now, obviously, the the next step is is going to be to go fo- pro, and you know the focus is going to move on to that. Now, what are the changes in the process from going to amateur to going pro? Like, do you have to get different kind of paperwork? 
you know, the same kind of thing, like, uh, you know, the East Coast and, you know, your coach going to set up the fights professionally. Like, how do you make the next step? Is it similar to amateur? Because I know, you you know, you often, we often hear as fans to read about stories about questionable promoters and not getting paid. Yeah. Is it the same kind of process where you have to look for legit promoters and they'll take care of you? Like, is, is there much change now that you're going, you're going to go pro soon or, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty similar? The Biggest change is the rules. Um, I've been very, very lucky. So a lot of amateur guys, especially now, when they start out, they have to. They have a special set of rules for amateurs. Like you can't ground and pound. Um, you cannot. You have to wear shin guards. Some of them. Some promotions have even bigger gloves. You can't head kick. Um, no knees to the face. No elbows. Uh, period, no elbows at all. So they have modified rules. Um, fighting in New York, I've been lucky. I haven't used shin guards since my second fight. Okay. So I, I've pretty much fought in at what they call advanced rules. So the only thing that I cannot do is knee to the face okay. or elbow. Mm -hmm. So outside of that, I pretty much got pro. Like That's pretty much pro rules. Right. Uh, um, that's the biggest adjustment for amateurs as they progress. Uh, in terms of promoters and things like that, it's the same. Uh, the promoters contact Coach Tito, and literally he'll give me a call like, "Hey, uh, March eighth, is everything all your paperwork ready?" I'm like, "Yeah, okay, you're fighting at this weight. Okay, cool. That's it." Wow. Like that's that's a conversation. He gives me the call. He tells me the day, the weight that I'm showing up, mm -hmm. and I go take care of the rest. But the promoters, you have to be careful with. I've dealt with some promoters. I've been blessed, again, to have dealt with mostly great promoters. But as an amateur, I've been put in situations where, like, I've been told to show up at 135, and my opponent has been told to show up at 145. Wow. Same day weigh-ins, and it's like, wait, what? Or they'll tell me, hey, it's uh, five rounds, uh, five two-minute rounds. And so I'm mentally prepared for that and developing a strategy for five rounds. And then it's like I'm in the middle of the fight, and they're like, the third and final round. Wow. I'm like, what? What are you, what are you talking about? Uh, so I've gotten the same advice for going pro. Like, be careful who you're dealing with. You have to be aware of the promotion. Make sure it's a legit promotion. Mm -hmm. Like, right now... Um, given the whole situation with New York being uh, not MMA not being legal in New York, I actually I wanted to go pro in November. Right. And I'm sorry, at the end of November, I was supposed to fight this in December, and the New Jersey Athletic Commission said no because they couldn't find enough like proof of me competing even though I have already fought six times and uh, like eight Muay Thai fights. Uh, so I actually have to take this fight in New Jersey to be able to like prove to them that I can, I can go pro. So like the New so, York sanctioning body, like they're just so poorly equipped for the switch over to MMA, you know, going pro recently that it's just everything's out of whack and they just didn't even keep a paper trail of amateur bouts for a while. And that's what, you no, no, New York did their job. Yeah. Because if you go like to the national database, you'll find my fights. Yeah, like topology, topology and stuff you're on. You'll find my fights. Yeah. New Jersey, um, be, until September, so anything before last September yeah. doesn't count for them. Wow. Being that it's from New York. They're yeah. pretty much saying, well, no, you guys weren't really, it wasn't really legal there. You guys were in the gray area, so we're just not going to count it. Wow. Um, New, New Jersey's kind of, playing a little hardball because I've seen guys from other schools jump over to like ring a combat and Bellator and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, I haven't seen those guys fight amateur in New Jersey, right. but that's, that's a different story for a different day. Um, so New Jersey has their set of rules and they, they are one of the toughest when it comes to their guidelines and rules. Wow. Like I was so, um, we were going back and forth. My fight for this Saturday was uh, they were telling me I had to wear shin guards and be novice rules when I've fought seven times. So yeah, you're a champion, yeah. Like, so I guess with New Jersey, you, you got to be on your P's and Q's when you're heading over there to make sure they, they welcome you with open arms.
Right. Now, now you know, as you're, you're rising up in the ranks, your name's getting out there, you're highly ranked in the Northeast, you know, you've won championships. Do you get contacted at all by, you know, coaches from other well-known schools or well-known schools in general, like hoping to maybe bring you over to their school, knowing your, your, you know, your value is so high and East Coast isn't as known? Well, I, I wouldn't say coaches. I haven't had many coaches um, like try to pry me away from my school. Mm-hmm. I, I would say I've had um, a lot of promoters like send me messages and like, hey, I can get you X, Y, Z, and promising things that I know they can't deliver. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so last question. Um, now you know because you just mentioned it. You 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 are fighting this weekend. You are weight cutting right now, which you know. Give give me like a little bit on the like the process that you go through to weight cut, and and I'm sure how terrible <laughs> it is. Like, what do you do to make weight? How how high do you start off at, and then work your way down to? Well, thankfully for this fight, I'm actually moving up a weight class. Oh, all right. Um, so uh, I'm going to be fighting the. To my understanding, the number one ranked featherweight in New Jersey or the tri-state area. Wow! But um, normally, my I try to stay within ten pounds of my. I fight at bantamweight at one thirty-five. Mm-hmm. Right. So I walk around one forty-five, one like at most, at most, and that's me eating a ton of cheesecake. It's one fifty. <laughs> like, I'm trying not to go past that, but okay. weight cutting. The the biggest problem with weight cutting is you're working just as hard with less fuel Mm. and like let's say the last week of now you may be six seven pounds out trying to now if you're consistently training you don't have much fat anymore at this point in time and you're trying to cut six pounds of water and maintain or weight for a week Mm. most of the time that that's why all of us are so grumpy. We're eating food that doesn't have much substance. It's really just like salad and maybe chicken. Some of us have to go vegan and make the weight. Right. And you're training still two to three times a day, getting punched and kicked in the face while you can't eat what you want. And then the last few days, uh, you're lacking water because if you're doing a water cut, the last you know two days you're drinking, let's say one a liter of water Mm -hmm. for the entire day when the body's used to a gallon gallon and a half wow um and some people depending how much weight you have to cut like you you cut out water completely the last day and still training so you know and to think about it this way and still knowing you're not gonna get paid (laughs) like that's passion that's desire right there it's tough now let everybody know who's gonna be you know listening to this uh, where is your fight at? Um, you know, the promotion, if there's tickets at all still available, they might all be sold out already. Like, just let everybody know, you know, where they can look you up if they're in the, the New Jersey area on Saturday to see you fight in person. So, this Saturday, we are going to be live for Dead Serious MMA. Promotion is going to be in the iPlay America Arena out in Freehold. Uh, for more information, you can go to deadseriousmma.com. Um, they should have some tickets still available. Very few to my understanding, but there might be some. Uh, you can look at my Instagram, the LG 23 You'll see more information there. Um, fights are going to start at 7 p.m. Be there. I'm going to be the main event. So Nice. You, you, it's supposed to be a good night of fight, so get there early, but definitely be on the lookout for the main event. All right, now moving on, we're going to do some breaking down of UFC 210. It's on Saturday night. All, it's in you know in New York, in Buffalo. Now, yeah. the first fight I want to talk about is Will Brooks at 18-2 and two versus Charles Oliveira, who's 21-7 and seven now. Brooks is, has nine decision wins in his, out of his 18 wins. He's coming off of a loss after a nine-fight winning streak from his Bellator uh, tenure into his first UFC fight. Uh, Oliveira has 13 submissions out of his 21 wins, and he's on a two-fight losing streak with losses to uh, Anthony Pettis and Ricardo Lamas, and is 1-3 and three in his last four with his other loss to Max Holloway. I mean, that's that's a pretty good 1-4. I mean, there's not a lot of shame in those three losses. Yeah, 
Alivera has gone through like a murderous row. Like, yeah. Now, other things to to wonder about is, uh, you know, Brooks had to face an opponent and and the, another Oliveira and and Alex, you know, who missed weight by several pounds and he fractured his rib, you know, that led to an upset, you know, loss. You know, how does Brooks bounce back from this? Uh, also, Will Brooks prefers to grapple often in his matchups. He likes to wrestle. Is and you know, is that I, I pose the question to you? Is he going to be playing into Du Bronx, which is great for two guys from the Bronx? Yeah. Um, is he going to be playing into his hands? Because he is a very crafty jujitsu player off of his back, and that just seems like it can be yeah. a very risky play by Will Brooks. What do you think? I really think Will Brooks is going to try to keep it standing and wrestle in reverse. Really? Um, because you, me personally, I don't really see too many people trying to play the jujitsu game with Du Bronx. Right. He's just so like his submissions come out of nowhere. Right. And he's longer than Will Brooks. So once they hit the ground, it, it's gonna create a problem for Will, in my opinion, being the shorter guy and having these long limbs just shooting at you from different angles. So I think Will Brooks is gonna try to keep it standing. Oliveira has been it, it's been shown that you can tag him and mm-hmm. you can put him down. So I think that's going to be Will's best play. And who do you think is going to win the fight? Is it going to be Brooks, and when do you think he would win? I think Brooks by decision. I think he's going to grind it out, a lot of stick and move. When I think he'll start wrestling towards, I want to say, end of the second round. Start mm-hmm. putting him on his back and just tire him out. I think Oliveira has shown that he, he can fatigue in some of his fights, especially... He's always had a problem hitting 155, so he he's on the cusp of like being forced to move up a weight class. So he might really go out of his way to make sure to to hit this weight, mm-hmm. which will affect his his stamina later in the later round. So I think well by decision. I agree. I I I, I think I think you made an excellent point by he wrestling reverse. That makes a lot of sense. I can see him. And he's he's such a good athlete. I mean, Oliveira is wild and unpredictable, and that's dangerous in its own way. But yeah, I see. You know, probably a decision. Maybe even a split. Maybe at some point, Oliveira gets in a serious danger and it gets real dicey. But he gets the win. Uh, I completely agree. Now moving on from that, we got Tiago Alves at twenty six and twelve versus Patrick Cote at twenty four and ten. Alves has 12 TKO, TKO and KO wins in his 26 victories. He has only fought four times since 2014, and he's 2-2 two and two in that period. He is currently on a two-fight losing streak with the losses to Carlos Condit and Jim Miller. Uh, Cote has 10 TKO or KO wins in his 24 victories. Both very good stand-up guys that can finish people. He is coming off of a loss to Donald Cerrone, which followed a three-fight winning streak. Now, the things I was, I, some of the things I want to throw out you is... Uh, both will, you know, both prefer to stand up and fight. Each has been, you know, TKO, TKO twice in their careers, which is interesting. Now, Cote is 37, but he's a 37 that's almost been rejuvenated going down in weight at 170. While Alves is, oddly enough, he's like a 33-year-old who has so much wear, he almost feels like he's 37. Um, yeah. who, who are your favorite in this fight? How do you see this one playing out? Uh, this is such a heartbreaker. Tiago Alves is one of my favorite fighters. Like mm-hmm. early on, watching the UFC before he fought George St. Pierre, he was on a tear. Yes, he was scary. Just everybody out. Um, the sentimental approach is I want to see Alves wins, uh-huh. but I, I think he's been in a lot of wars. And mm-hmm. Cote, he's durable. He he can take punches. It was. Even knowing how Donald Cerrone, how Cowboy is and, uh, as an elite striker, it yeah. was still a surprise to see Patrick Cote get knocked, mm-hmm. get knocked out. So I, I think Cote will be able to weather the storm, especially being the bigger guy. And um, Alves has been fighting a lot of injuries trying to get back and and just to get to this fight. So I just don't think he'll have the power anymore to really... Like knock out Cote, and Cote is just going to be able to box with him, move around a lot. Uh, Alves looks like he's slowing down. Do you think Alves is to a point maybe he's wise enough, but maybe he could play like a keep away game, use the leg kicks, and try to keep distance and movement? Or he's always, I mean, he's always been a guy that loads up on the weights and, and doesn't have great cardio. Is that just you know, it's it's you can't teach a new, an old, you know, old dog new tricks, and he is what he is. I mean, I've. I think he can learn new tricks, and I've been seeing his Instagram, and he looks like he's been working a lot on his cardio. Okay. But I think the problem is, can he avoid the firefight? Yeah. Like, 
when that's in your blood and you enjoy going in there and just trading punches, can he honestly, you know, stand there in the center and not trade punches with Patrick Cote and stick to the game plan? I think Cote will be able to take him off his game plan. How does he win? Does he win the decision or he could he actually finish Atiyah Valdez? Um, if he finishes, it's going to be in the third uh, TKO. I don't see a clean knockout. I would say a TKO in the third round. Yeah, this is this you you, you nailed it. This is a tough one. I, I I always worry about an older fighter as good as he's been at that age. The lower the weight class go, and MMA is such a cruel sport in that a guy can literally age overnight and just change. And I I'm actually oh man, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Alves honestly. I I think he'll grind out a surprising decision somehow, and 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 Cote. I wouldn't be surprised if somehow like Cote, he he's just not the same after Cerrone. Like, you know, yeah, you've yeah. been in enough wars and you, you finally take that final finishing kind of fight. And you get hurt and you're never quite the same. But would yeah. not be surprised if I'm wrong and you're right. But moving on from that one, we have Cynthia Calvillo at 4-0 versus Pearl Gonzalez, who's making her UFC debut at a 6-1. Calvillo is undefeated with two wins by TKO KO and one each by submission and decision. Gonzalez lost her debut fight of her career and then went on a six-fight winning streak since then, coming and with four coming by submission. Uh, Cavillo fights for Team Alpha Male. Now, these two I don't know a ton about, um, but I think it's a perfect question to ask you as an up-and-coming fighter. You know, when you have two young fighters who don't have a lot on their resume and a lot to scout from, um, and I'm sure you've been in this position many times, how do you – do you just aim to do – to just – strategize and do what you do well and not worry so much about them when you have such a short you know bunch of tape to look at or do you try to find what you can and work from there yeah at this point there's not much to go at so you focus on what you do best like you you develop the game plan on your strengths and don't worry about the weaknesses because you may not know it you may not have uh, information on let's say pro gonzalez who's making her debut you may not be able to find tape so you have to really hone in on what you do best. And, you know, once you get in there, you're going to have to adjust. That's the biggest, like, I don't want to say problem because it's not a problem, but that's the biggest area where people fail isn't making their in-fight adjustment. How can, like, Cynthia goes out there and starts being an all-star Muay Thai fighter. Like, how do you adjust to that? Right. I mean, I mean, I because you're so, I don't have a ton of information on that. I'm going to, my gut feels like, you know, someone that's on a six-fight winning streak, I know it's a UFC debut, so you're not sure, you know, what the competition level is, but four submissions, like, I'm going to pick um, Pearl Gonzalez in this one. Do you have, do you lean any either way? Like, maybe does, does the fact that Cavillo fought, has already fought in the UFC, what's the helper? Like, you, you know, everybody talks about that UFC debut adrenaline dump. Maybe that, yeah. you know, gives her an advantage over Gonzalez. Well, from my little research, I'm going to have to go against my cousin, Pearl, my second, third cousin, twice removed. Um, (laughs) According to what I was able to dig up, it's just the competition uh, that Pearl has gone against Mm -hmm. hasn't been to the caliber that I feel like Cynthia training in Team Alpha Male. Right. She's getting, like, top guys and girls down there just banging every day. Um I just think Pro might be a little tentative at first, and Cynthia's going to come out strong and fast and just take advantage of those jitters at the beginning. Uh, but, again, with either fighter, there's just not much to go off on. Right. Now, moving on to the co-main event and the main event. These fights, as a fan, I have a lot of interest in. It's going to be hard to make certain decisions in this one. Uh, one's a New York guy. One's just a fighter I've always liked. Now, for the co-main event... We've got Chris Weibin making his second appearance in a New York City, a New York State fight. He's thirteen and two versus Gegar Mousasi at forty one six and two. Man. This guy looks like he's twenty six and he's fought more than like Evandale Silva has. Uh, Weibin is on a two fight losing streak after starting his career at thirteen and zero. He has six TKO KOs. He has four decisions and three submissions, so the guy can win all kinds of ways. Musasi is on a four-fight win streak with wins against Uriah Hall, Vitor Belfort, Tiago Santos, and Titalis Latis. He has 34 finishes, 22 yeah, by TKO KO. Insane. Like, when I think of Game Guard, I, I usually think, like, really good grappling. Like, he, he's, he's a scary man. Uh, yeah, he's, he's well-rounded all the way around. Yeah. Now, 
after two big losses, does Wyman go back to, you know, do, do you think he go back to basics here? Like, I wonder if he goes back to the guy that in his UFC debut went against that insanely great grappler in Damian Maia and just completely dominated with the wrestling and instead of, go, go, you know, goes away from the standing at all. Uh, especially since Musashi is a guy that he can be wrestled a bit. He, you know, he fought yeah. at, like against a guy like King Mo. He got utterly dominated in the wrestling now. Uh, or can Musashi keep him standing if, if Wyman even takes that tack? Uh, you know, what do you, what are you thinking about? It was another interesting thing I found as good as a submission guy, as Musashi is, and he's dangerous and clever. He actually doesn't have a finish submission since 2014. Yeah. So it's not like a, he's, you know, he's really, he prefers to stand up at this point. Well, how, how do you see this one playing out? It depends on which Chris Weidman comes out. Yes, I agree. Um, because if you have that 13 and 0 Chris Weidman, that's coming to put that pressure, that All-American wrestler just putting Musasi down and tiring him out. I think Weidman can finish Musasi in the second round just with his, like, constant pressure. Right. But if he falls into what he's been doing the last two fights and is striking in that exchange, I think Musasi tags him up. And Musasi is very dangerous. And I think one thing that's going to play into this fight, Musasi has long arms, like right. really long. He looks like Dal Sim, just hitting yeah. you from all angles. <laughs> yeah. You so know, that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what's fascinating is that as great as Musasi is, he doesn't necessarily have, like, huge marquee kind of ways. Now, he has Vitor Belfort, which Weidman has, but we all know when he got Vitor, Vitor is a bit of a different man now. And the thing yeah. we always have, we have to take into account is also is, in the two losses Wyman has to Luke Rocco, where he watched lost his title, I mean, it was a pretty competitive fight. He also supposedly had a broken foot, which who knows how much it took out of him, which is a problem. And then the second fight, I don't know how you felt. I felt he was beating Yoel Rio, and he was on his way to a possible decision. So he's had two losses, but they're, you know, they're, they, he didn't get, like, dominated. And he just wasn't there. Like, he, he lost a good fight, and then got caught with a great flying knee by Romero in the second fight. Like, do you think his caliber of competition is much more than we're leading on. And maybe, you know, some people might be sleeping on him a little bit because Musashi is on fire right now. Yeah, that's a little tough because it's like, you know, in sports, when you're leading into the playoff, do you take the number, the overall rank number one, right. or do you take the team that's streaking right, right. now? Right, great point. It's usually, and I think that's what we have here mm -hmm. because when Chris Weidman's on his game, like, he can pretty much beat anybody in that division. Mm -hmm. But you saw what Luke Rockhold was able to do. To albeit, I think Luke Rockhold is better on the ground than what Musashi is in terms of finishing. Mm -hmm. But and striking wise, they're both long, and I think Musashi can keep him at bay long enough to you know force him into a mistake. So do you think he he gets he beats Weidman and gets a finish? My heart wants Weidman to go in there and avenge these two losses. <laughs> Be the New Year guy, go in there on fire, yeah. and he's going to grind out a decision victory against Musashi and put a stop to the streak. I, 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 I'm hoping for the same. I, I'm going to go with that too. Like, I think the one advantage he has in going against Musashi while he is on fire is that I think in, in we've noticed at this point, especially against Anderson and even Vitor, like, Wyman is a guy that's not... He's not fast. He's he's pretty lumbering for the weight class. Great athlete, super yeah. strong, amazing grappler. But he's rather he lumbers. I mean, he's a guy that if he went to two hundred five, I don't think that'd be a terrible move for him because he's such a big guy. And Musashi is not a fleet of foot super athlete. He's a phenomenal fighter. He's technically super sound, but he's also a slower fighter. So I think it helps Wyman in terms of if he wants to set up getting takedowns and and yeah. doing work. And I'm sorry if a guy like Damian Maya and Anderson Silva don't put a guy like Weidman in danger, especially since this is such an important fight for him. This isn't some sleep late. This is make or break. This is a chance to maybe be on a three-fight losing streak. I think if he gets Musashi down, he just beats him up, and Musashi yeah. doesn't have much to offer. So I'm, I'm going to go with the same thing, I'm, and my heart is going to go with Weidman in a, de in a decision. Now, moving on to the main event, which is a big deal fight. Super excited. We got Daniel Cormier, the man I feel is the most underrated fighter of the last five years, no one gives this man any credit. Well, people don't like him. I do, That's and I, I, I don't get it. And he, they didn't like him even before he started doing like the purposeful advertisement trash talk. Like they didn't like him when he was just a nice guy. Yeah, it, it, that's the problem. You know, 
you, you, some people are likable, some people yeah. are not. And he's an intelligent Olympian, a father, all these great things, but I, I don't know what it is. It's like, like I, I like him. Like, I love him. I think he's like a cuddly teddy bear. He's fantastic. Guy. Yeah, but, like, he, I, I don't know, man. Yeah, well, he, I, I can see why people don't, but. Yeah, like he's like him. anti John Jones, and there are so many people that like John Jones. He's like the opposite. He's small. He's kind of you know pudgyish. He, he's he's you know he, yeah he's like an old school fighter. But okay, Dan Cormier eighteen and one, Anthony Johnson twenty two and five. Cormier is on a three fight win streak following his lone loss of his career to the aforementioned John Jones. He has six wins by TKO or KO, five submissions and seven decisions. The guy can win anyway, though. It's, often decision, especially at this level. Uh, Johnson's on a three-fight win streak of his own after losing to the Cormier in the re- in the original fight. His wins are against J- Jimmy Manua, the recently uh, Bellator signee Ryan Bader, and Glover Teixeira. He was chosen as the UFC... He, there was a recent show that UFC did the best knockout artist of all time, and we talked about this a little bit. Yeah. And he was chosen as number one, and I, it was fascinating. I didn't think it, understand that at first, but now I do. I looked it over. He has 16 TKO KO wins, 12 of them in the first round in yeah. his career. 12 first-round knockouts. Now, some of the things to wonder is Johnson has a six-inch reach, which is very big. Uh... You know, another thing is, does Johnson switch up? Does he maybe try to play a smarter game? Like, does he, does he, does he have, like, a measured pace? Does he go a little slower? Does he try to conserve energy this time around? Maybe work a jab because he has the reach? And, <laughs> you know, it might be a better thing for a guy that has, like, a questionable gas tank at time. Or does he just have to do what he's gotten that got him to the dance and just come like that raging bull? And the, the other thing, and this has to go for, for Daniel Cormier, too, because I brought it up with Cote. Comey just turned 38, and we know about the injuries he's had. I wonder, and do you wonder, is this the night Daniel Cormier finally gets old and he isn't at the elite level anymore? Well, I don't think he gets old. I think Rumble Force is the issue. (laughs) We discussed the reason why I think Rumble was rated the number one is because he just doesn't knock people out. He puts people... Like he changes out. their life. <laughs> like, he sends them back one in time, hit and you could see people's soul almost leaving. Yes. Like they have to bring it back. Yes, he doesn't and need the, Shang Tsung to say finish him. They are finished. And it, Cormier is on record saying that Anthony Johnson has hit him the hardest yeah. he's ever been hit. Yep. And I think Johnson's going to use that man. Like he knows now, he can be a little bit more patient. He. He knows he can hurt him. I think that sometimes with a striker, you you have to you have to go out there and see if this this guy can take your punch. Right. Now he saw what Cormier can do. He was a little overzealous. He caught him, but like you saw, he went went for broke, emptied the gas tank, and then it became a problem later on. Mm-hmm. But I think, like you said, he's going to use the jab a little more, be a little more judicious with the power shots because all he really needs is one, man. The one thing that I'm up- hoping... Oh, no, yeah, continue, continue. Oh, that uppercut he landed on Glover Teixeira was right. just like... Yeah. Holy. I mean, the thing I wonder, too, and I mean, not only wonder, but I'm hoping as a Daniel Cormier fan is, uh, you know, since that fight, he's fought very good strikers. You know, he fought Alexander, Alexander Gustafsson in a fantastic war with a guy who, again, had reach, you know, moves around, dangerous striker, not as dangerous power-wise, but very, very talented, diverse striker. Then he fought Anderson on, on short, was it like three days notice kind of craziness? And- yeah, that wasn't much of a fight. Yeah, no, and but you know what? He went in there and still with a guy like Anderson and just utterly dominated him. And Dennis is not an easy guy to take down, but yeah, without doubt, that there's questions to it. But you know, knowing you know he's fought some better strikers since then. You know, he has fought Anthony Johnson before. Like he now he knows what he's getting into. Now he knows like okay, I can't just trust my chin with this guy. Does that help him? Does that hurt him? I remember Randy Couture once said that you know rematches favor the guy who lost because the guy who won is, you know, he knows what he did to win. What is he going to change? You know, he felt what he did the first time works, you know, so what's the change? Well, the guy who lost, he knows what to do different. He know what's, he knew, knows what cost in the fight. You know, knowing all those things, who are you, you picking for this fight? I think Anthony Johnson pulls it out. Yeah. You mentioned the Gustafson fight, and I, funny thing, I was honestly watching that fight today, mm-hmm. and 
Gustafson was moving around a lot, but he just didn't have that power right. to force uh, Cormier to respect it. Right. So Cormier just kept coming forward. Mm-hmm. You're not coming forward <laughs> at, at Anthony Johnson. Like, it's just not happening. Yeah. I mean, if you try, you, you we all saw what happens to people that do. Um, so well, he it, did come forward on him in the second fight because he knew he was tired. Like, you can't come forward on him in the first, in the first round. round. Like, don't, don't do it. Yeah. It's a bad idea. Yeah. But if Anthony Johnson does take a page from the Gustafson fight where Gustafson was throwing the jab, catching him with the jab, and then moving, and as Cormier went to engage, throwing uppercuts, like, man, Anthony Johnson catches that uppercut. Ooh. He's going to hurt. Yes. And I think he'll be smarter now with adjusting the game plan and not, even though he has him hurt, being more respectful of Daniel Cormier's wrestling and not going in there and going for broke in the first round. He He's going to have to either... If he doesn't put him on in the first two rounds, I, I think Cormier is going to grind him out. But I, I think, I honestly think Anthony Johnson is going to knock him out within two. Yeah, I I love Dan Cormier. He's probably my favorite fighter. You know, now that Dan Henderson's gone and George St. Pierre is, I don't know what the hell he's doing. But um, he's my favorite fighter, and I I feel the same. Like, I just feel like this is a time, like, and it's unfortunate because I've been dying for him to fight John Jones again and get a second crack at him and and see how that plays out the second time. But it's just too long of a wait. He's, again, like I mentioned, I just worry about age. I mean, age is different, especially at these weight classes, heavyweight, you know, older guys can hang around longer. But just the wear and tear of a, a wrestling career in the Olympics. He's had multiple knee surgeries now. He's he's only getting older. I mean, he he always gets better every fight. That's what I love about him. He always comes out with new stuff, but I agree. I I, I just feel like Anthony Johnson's going to get that finish. He's going to work a jab, you know, set it up, and he's going to set up some thunder, and then, he, like, Daniel's not going to have time to recover, and, and that's going to be the problem. Now, that is our picks for UFC 210. Uh, Lewis, is there anything like uh, you want to promote in terms of uh, other than you know not just you know, of course for promote the, the fight on Saturday, but you know your Instagram, your Facebook, anything in Twitter, any other social media things you have if people want to follow you and look you up. Yeah, guys. Um, so this Saturday, hopefully, hopefully praying will be my last amateur fight for Death Series MMA against one of the best one forty fivers out in New York in the tri state area. So. Check that out, deadseriousmma.com for more information. Uh, or look me up on Instagram, the LG23, uh, Twitter, Louis G0423, Facebook, just go, go for the assassin, Luis Gonzalez. You'll find me. Uh, I just want to thank you, Jason, for having me. We, we've been trying to get this done for some time now, but I appreciate the time that you're giving me and everything that you do for the MMA community. Uh, um, thank you, I've, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I mean, you, you're awesome guests, and I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. And you, you mean you gave these people a lot of fascinating things to know if they did not know what it takes to be an amateur fighter in this world. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, now that is Sucker Shot Seven. Come back next time for our next ep- next episode. He is Luis Gonzalez. Check him on his fight this Saturday. We're out. See you later.